Boa noite. Sejam bem-vindos ao Teatro Paulo Altran, do Sesc Pinheiros. O senhor professor Danilo Santos de Miranda, diretor regional do Sesc São Paulo e a editora Companhia das Letras, agradecem a presença de todos. Em homenagem aos 25 anos da Companhia das Letras, a Mos Oz realiza a conferência Literatura e Guerra, Perspectivas Israelenses, encerrando a série de atividades promovidas ao longo deste ano. Ao término da conferência, será oferecido um coquetel no andar térreo, bem como uma sessão de autógrafos com o escritor Amos Oz. Serão autografados 100 livros, sendo um livro por pessoa, mediante a retirada de senhas. Antes de darmos continuidade ao evento, desejamos agradecer a presença do senhor Carlos Augusto Calil, secretário municipal da Cultura da Cidade de São Paulo. Passamos agora a palavra ao senhor Luiz Schwartz, editor da Companhia das Letras. Boa noite. Eu ia começar com os tradicionais agradecimentos, mas olhando essa auditória agora aqui, não vou resistir a falar uma. fazer uma pequena digressão. Vamos ver se está melhor agora. Eu estou a três dias com o Amazos aqui no, no Brasil, e nós, esses três dias, temos é, realizado um, um duelo é, incessante de piadas de mãe judia. É, ele ganhou já, mas... E olhando aqui, me lembrei de uma que eu contei para ele, e que reproduz um pouco o sentimento meu aqui, 25 anos depois de começar a Companhia das Letras, olhando para esse auditório. A mãe judia telefona para o departamento de reclamações da maior loja de departamentos dos Estados Unidos, do Macy's, e atende a pessoa do outro lado da linha, fala, Macy's, departamento de reclamações, e ela faz, ui, ui, ui. Acho que eu queria fazer só esse, ui, 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 e ir embora. É, tem muitos autores que me consideram a sua mãe judia, e então entendem um pouco esse suspiro cheio de prazer. Só as mães judias sabem dar. Bom, queria agradecer a presença do Calil, nosso autor, e aqui também na posição de secretário da Cultura. Eu queria agradecer ao Sesc. Danilo Miranda não está aqui hoje à noite, mas o Sesc tem sido sempre o lugar das grandes festividades da Companhia das Letras. Aqui nós tivemos a última palestra do José Saramago, Aqui tivemos o lançamento da obra do Jorge Amado, da Lígia Fagundes Teles, muitos acontecimentos importantes na nossa história. Eu vou começar com os rápidos agradecimentos, lembrando de algumas pessoas que não estão aqui e que me ajudaram muito quando a Companhia das Letras começou, 25 anos atrás, no fundo do, da gráfica do dos meus avós e dos meus pais, e são justamente o meu avô, minha avó, Giuseppe, Mitzi e meu pai André, que vibraram tanto com o começo da Companhia das Letras, tanto orgulho, aquele sucesso inesperado para todos, e não estão mais aqui. 
Dando sequência à minha piada de mãe judia, queria agradecer à minha mãe, que, que sim, está aqui, graças a Deus, e acho que com os excessos afetivos dela, ela acabou criando esse ser meio paranoico, meio perfeccionista. E, além de me pro, proporcionar um repertório de piadas de não ficção, né? É, mãe judia. É, eu queria agradecer a Maria Helena, não sei se ela está aqui, a Maria Helena Salles, que acompanhou o começo da, da ideia que viu surgir essa vontade de ter uma editora e me ajudou a encontrar a força dentro de mim para parir a Companhia das Letras. Eu queria agradecer aos meus sócios, o, o Fernando, e que com ele, e com ele Pedro, João e Walter, o Fernando acho que também não está aqui, mas, enfim, eu procurei sócios e acabei encontrando grandes amigos, quase irmãos. O Sérgio, o Ginho, que, é, junto com o Fernando, planejaram uma editora antes dela existir e acabaram entrando depois, um pouco mais para frente. E o Sérgio é o meu oposto, de certa maneira, me ajuda... É, talvez cortando um pouco as minhas asas, um lado meio atirado demais que eu tenho. É, eu vou na sala dele, ouço, fico bravo, mas a mistura acaba dando certo. E ele é o meu companheiro de todas as horas, o que tem participado intimamente, e, e o resultado que vocês estão vendo aí é muito grande, graças a, ao apoio que ele tem me dado. A Elisa, a Maria Emília e agora o Matinas, que são sócios honoris causa, né? e que também são grandes amigos que têm acompanhado a trajetória da companhia. Uma amiga especial que veio dos Estados Unidos para cá, para esse evento, um pouco um exemplo de como, fazendo livros, eu acabei fazendo grandes amigos. Essa pessoa é Maria Campbell, a minha representante, scout e grande amiga, de, quem eu tenho, de cuja amizade eu tenho muito orgulho. Eu queria agradecer a todos os funcionários da editora, é, eu acho que, eu fiquei pensando hoje em casa, eu acho que eu vou mudar, não vai ter nomes de cargos nas editoras, vão ser todos editores, a partir de agora. Porque, no fundo, todos trabalham com, gostam muito dos livros, leem. Então, acho que vai ter o editor de entregas, o editor de contabilidade. É, eu, acho que, eu acho que vai ser a próxima mudança na, na companhia. Queria agradecer o Pedro e a Júlia, que acho que foram as melhores coisas que eu ajudei a fazer, junto com a Lili. Né? E também o Luiz Henrique, agora, que faz parte da família, e as magníficas Zizi e Alice. As Zizi e Alice são hoje minhas professoras de ficção, de filosofia e de alegria. Precisa de algo melhor do que isso? É, eu queria, por fim, fazer o um agradecimento mais importante, que é para a Lili, que sem ela nada disso teria acontecido. É, quando a coisa sai certa é porque ela me editou. É, editou meu coração, meu corpo, minha cabeça. Obrigado, Lili. Ah, junto com a Lili veio uma família maravilhosa, minha família é muito pequena, então todos da família Moritz, eu queria agradecer. Eu queria falar um pouco da escolha do Amozós para essa noite. Quando nós pensamos em fazer essa série de eventos, nós queríamos terminar com o um evento, não fazer uma festa. A festa já foi em Paraty, aquela dança gostosa tudo, e tudo. Eu imediatamente pensei no Amozós, foi o primeiro autor, que eu queria um autor que fosse um grande amigo, mesmo que nós não nos vemos com frequência, mas um amigo que a gente sentisse como amigo assim dentro do coração e que pudesse representar todos os escritores com a sua presença. Telefonei para o Amos e... Ele pediu uma semana e, em uma semana, ele topou. Então, eu acho que, através dele, eu homenageio todos os autores. A editora só existe graças a, a você, Amos, e a todos os escritores. Eu acho que esse público está aqui, de certa maneira, para mostrar é, que esse é o nosso papel, para mostrar para o Amos como nós gostamos dele, para mostrar para os escritores como nós gostamos da literatura. Eu queria contar também um pequeno episódio, é, rapidamente, que aconteceu no Rio de Janeiro, 
uh, antes da, desse evento, nós tivemos um evento no Instituto Moreira Salles, e antes do evento começar, a Joana pediu uh, licença para trazer uma pessoa para o camarim, ou para a sala onde nós estávamos esperando, e veio um rapaz muito simples, e que falou, olha, eu vim de Piuim, Piuim, a 800 quilômetros do Rio de Janeiro, em Minas Gerais, onde eu tenho uma livraria que se chama Oz. E deu essa foto para o Amos Oz. É uma livraria e um cybercafé, e eu presenciei, eu acho que se o Amos não, não viesse falar aqui, ele veio para o Brasil para receber essa foto, que mostra um pouco a importância que ele tem para nós brasileiros. Eu é, queria realmente agradecer muito ao Amos por ter aceitado esse convite, e eu acho que esse público aqui e essa foto são o melhor presente que a gente pode dar para ele. Eu tinha começado a procurar alguma coisa para ler um, um parágrafo só de uma obra dele que, de preferência, falasse de amizade, porque eu tenho falado tanto aqui de amizade, né? amizade é, como a forma que é, faz com que os livros são feitos, com que os livros nascem na companhia das letras, pelo menos eu vejo assim. Alguns não, né? alguns acham que é o contrário. Mas eu estava procurando e, de repente, a agente literária do Amos nos mandou um novo prefácio que o Amos tinha feito para comemorar 40 anos do seu livro My, Meu Michel. Eu não li aquele prefácio imediatamente, mas como a Lili estava lendo Meu Michel, eu mandei para ela, falei, olha, olha o prefácio que chegou, você está lendo o livro, estou é, te mandando, depois eu vou ler. Em seguida, a Lili sabia que... E eu tinha pedido a ela se achasse algum parágrafo no Meu Michel, que eu tinha lido há muito tempo, que me apontasse, enquanto eu estava lendo outros livros, ou relendo alguns que eu tinha lido. E a Lili me ligou e falou, olha, eu acho que tem, nesse prefácio você pode se inspirar para falar o que você quer falar naquela, na, na nossa noite. Eu fui ler o prefácio e eu achei que eu não devia me inspirar nele, que eu devia lê-lo, porque, de certa maneira, eu acho que também isso simboliza um pouco o que nós, editores, fazemos. Nós falamos através dos autores. Eu não quero falar além desses agradecimentos, nenhuma palavra que seja minha, mas eu queria usar, pedir licença para usar a palavra do Amos, que é o que eu sei fazer, usar a palavra dos autores, mostrar a palavra dos autores, respeitar a palavra dos autores, espalhar a palavra dos autores. Essa que eu acho que é a função dos editores. Então, eu vou terminar com mais alguns minutos, é, mas vocês vão estar na companhia do Amos Oz, através das minhas, da minha voz ou da minha leitura. Esse prefácio ele foi feito para celebrar 40 anos desse livro, que foi o primeiro grande sucesso de Amos Oz, não foi seu primeiro livro. E é um livro no qual uma mulher narra como ela vê o seu marido, ou a, narra a sua vida, de certa maneira, e narra o Michel que existe, o Michel que existe na ficção e o Michel imaginário que existe dentro da ficção. Amos diz no seu prefácio, que será publicado numa próxima edição do Meu Michel, aqui no Brasil, o seguinte. Escrevi o romance Meu Michel sob o ponto de vista de uma mulher, na primeira pessoa. Eu tinha 26 anos e estava seguro de que sabia tudo sobre as mulheres. Hoje, eu não ousaria escrever um romance inteiro adotando a voz feminina. Depois que o livro foi publicado, recebi muitas cartas de mulheres que me perguntavam admiradas. Como é que você sabe? Mas também recebi cartas de outras que me repreendiam por não saber coisa alguma. Nunca vou descobrir quem tinha razão. A verdade é que escrevi meu Michel sob coação. A personagem de Hannah tomou conta de mim de tal maneira que comecei a falar sua língua e a sonhar seus sonhos. E não porque tivesse copiado de uma pessoa real, de forma nenhuma. Ela veio, não sei bem de onde, instalou-se em mim e não me deixou mais em paz. Resisti-lhe durante meses e não escrevi uma só linha. Quem sou eu para escrever sobre o amor, o casamento, a desilusão de uma jovem de Jerusalém, dez anos mais velha que eu? 
mas Rana não quis me largar. Trouxe com ela para minha vida o seu Michel, os pais dela e os dele, seu filho e seus vizinhos, o bairro todo, Jerusalém inteira e também os gêmeos árabes de seus sonhos que se tornaram meus sonhos. Tive de começar a escrever a obra para me livrar dela e voltar à minha vida. Minha vida naquela época era de um kibbutznik, de Hulda, que dividia seu tempo entre lecionar e trabalhar no campo, muito longe de Hannah Gonen, de seu amor agonizante e de sua lúgubre Jerusalém. Não achei que fosse capaz de terminar o livro, achei que fosse escrever algumas páginas sobre Hannah, talvez um conto, e com isso me ver livre dela. Eu não estava assim tão interessado nela ou em seus problemas conjugais, e suas fantasias secretas não me atraíam muito. Comecei a escrever o livro em 1965, antes da publicação do meu primeiro romance. De início, eu escrevi apenas às quintas-feiras. Naquele ano, o kibbutz me concedeu um dia de semana para minhas experiências literárias. Para minhas experiências literárias. Mas Hannah logo me obrigou a escrever sua história todos os dias da semana. Nili e eu, e nossas duas filhas, vivíamos então em alojamentos que consistiam num quarto pequeno e no outro quarto com metade do tamanho deste, perto dos escritórios do kibbutz, em frente à parada de ônibus. Eu chegava em casa à tarde, tomava uma ducha e dedicava o começo da noite à família. Quando as meninas e Nili iam dormir, me sentava para escrever duas ou três horas. Como eu não tinha um escritório e era incapaz de escrever uma linha que fosse sem um cigarro aceso entre os dedos, e como Nili não conseguia dormir num quarto cheio de fumaça e com a luz acesa, eu me trancava no minúsculo banheiro, mais ou menos do tamanho de um banheiro de avião, e ali eu abaixava o tampo do vaso, sentava-me e colocava sobre os joelhos um volume de reproduções de Van Gogh, que ganhara de presente de casamento. Abria meu caderno em cima do livro de arte, acendia um cigarro e escrevia o que Hannah meditava. Até a meia-noite ou até uma da manhã, quando os olhos já me pesavam de cansaço e tristeza. Quando ouço falar de escritores que vão buscar inspiração em lugares impregnados de atmosfera, com cenários deslumbrantes, lembro que escrevi a maior parte de meu Michel no banheiro, o que talvez esteja refletido no livro, que em sua maior parte transcorre num minúsculo, atulhado e lúgubre apartamento de teto baixo em Jerusalém. Eu disse que escrevia tudo o que Hannah meditava, mas não é bem assim. A verdade é que lutei contra ela com todas as minhas forças. Mais de uma vez, até mais de duas vezes, me surpreendi dizendo, isso não tem cabimento, não é da sua natureza, não vou escrever isso. Ela me repreendia. Não venha me dizer o que é o que é o que não é na minha natureza. Cale-se e escreva. Eu insistia, não vou escrever isto por você. Lamento muito. Procure outra pessoa, uma mulher. Não posso escrever isso, não sou mulher, não sou uma autora. Ela continuava inflexível. Escrevia o que mando, escreva o que mando e não me interrompa. Mas não sou seu secretário. Você é só uma personagem do meu livro e não o contrário. Lutávamos assim à noite, ela e eu. Às vezes eu fazia o que ela queria, outras vezes me recusava terminantemente. Até hoje, não sei se o livro teria ficado melhor ou pior se eu tivesse cedido a Hannah mais do que cedi ou menos. Quando terminei de escrever meu Michel, em abril de 1967, um mês antes da Guerra dos Seis Dias, e finalmente me desvencilhei da escravidão de Hannah, sentei-me para ler o livro e muitas dúvidas me ocorreram. Eu produzir um romance no qual ninguém era assassinado, ninguém era traído, a crônica previsível de um casamento que deu errado, de uma mulher um tanto histérica, um marido melancólico, um menino meio nerd, vizinhos sujos e uma Jerusalém dividida que figura na história como hibernal, sombria e sinistra. Além disso, seis semanas depois, tocava-se o chofar no Muro das Lamentações e o ar estava impregnado da Jerusalém de ouro exatamente o oposto da Jerusalém de Hannah e Michel. Se eu não tivesse terminado o livro um mês antes daquela guerra, certamente jamais o terminaria. Pensei comigo mesmo, esse livro só vai interessar a um punhado de pessoas sensíveis, dispostas a ler um romance que a rigor não tem enredo, cujos heróis não são heróis, e que se passa numa cidade, Jerusalém dividida, que não existe mais. 
com dor no coração, entreguei os originais a um editor da Am Oved. Ele leu e me disse que, infelizmente, o livro não tinha potencial de venda. Eu também escolhi esse texto pelo retrato que faz os editores. E não teria apelo para os leitores de sua popular série A Biblioteca do Povo. A rigor, disse ele, parecia mais um livro de poesia, escrito com sensibilidade, mas inadequado para o grande público. Sugeriu-me algumas ideias para melhorá-lo. Por exemplo, Hannah deveria trair Michel pelo menos uma vez. Ou Michel poderia revelar-se um gênio da ciência e alcançar a fama internacional. Outra possibilidade seria ambos deixarem Jerusalém e começarem vida nova em outro lugar, talvez um kibbutz. Ou que tal, que tal mudar o título de meu Michel para os diários de Hannah? E por que um nome tão fora de moda? Talvez eu pudesse chamá-la de Noah ou Ruth. Mas mesmo que eu me recusasse a fazer tais mudanças, disse o editor, a Amoved publicaria o romance do jeito que estava. Ele queria apenas me fazer refletir, mostrar-me como injetar um pouco de vida em minha apagada história. A expressão escrito com sensibilidade me deixou lisonjeado e concordei com o editor no que dizia respeito ao grande público. Ele queria lançar uma tiragem bem pequena, mas devido ao contratempo com outro livro, My Michel acabou saindo em abril de 1968, quase um ano depois que o submeti à editora como parte da Biblioteca do Povo. Para a surpresa do editor, e também para a minha surpresa de um punhado de amigos íntimos que tinham lido os originais, meu Michel tornou-se um best-seller quase da noite para o dia, lido tanto por mulheres como por homens. Quase 130 mil exemplares foram vendidos em Israel e centenas de milhares foram comprados por leitores das 28 línguas em que foi traduzido, nas 72 edições lançadas no mundo inteiro. Talvez seja verdade que alguns livros são universais precisamente por serem muito locais e tenham um grande alcance precisamente por serem minimalistas. Talvez. Às vezes recuo no tempo e penso em Hannah Gonen e no marido Michel, em seu apartamento lúgubre, na vida monótona que levavam, e me lembro da voz de Hannah falando-me no banheiro do kibbutz, sobre a prisão que era sua vida, seu insaciado desejo de terras distantes, cidades agitadas e vastos panoramas. Vejo Hannah em pé junto à janela, sempre descortinando as distâncias que não podia alcançar, e digo-lhe para mim mesmo, Hannah, agora você está em toda parte, Japão, Coreia, China, Bulgária, Finlândia, Brasil. As coisas melhoraram um pouco, não? Desejo-lhe boa viagem e retorno ao que estou escrevendo. Tão longe dela e não tão longe assim. Muito obrigado, Amosés. Thank you, Luiz. I can't even say it was a wonderful introduction because it sounds too familiar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends, good evening and shalom to all of you. I am here in Brazil for the 25th anniversary of Compania das Letras. And let me give you a little lesson in Hebrew, short one. The Hebrew word for publisher, mol, is very close to the Hebrew word for midwife, meyaledet. And I think it's just as well. Louise Schwartz said that as a publisher, he feels like a Jewish mother. I think perhaps the right metaphor for publishing house is a midwife, helping the baby to be born, helping the baby to breathe, helping the baby to get, the baby to get out of the mother's womb and into life. So I am the Jewish mother, Louise, and you are the midwife. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to talk about war and battlefield in Israeli literature and about some of my own Israeli perspectives. You will be surprised to hear how little there is in Israeli literature about the battlefield. 
Very, very few Israeli novels actually describe the experience of fighting. And this is not for nothing. The experience of fighting on the battlefield is so different, so remote from any other human experience that I personally find it impossible to render in words. The battlefield is made of smells, of stenches, of terrible odors, and there is not enough words in the language to convey the stenchiness of the battlefield. However, I'll share with you one battlefield experience only to show you how far the normalcy of our everyday life is from the abnormalcy of the battlefield. On the eve of the Six Day War of 1967, I was recruited as a junior officer with a tank unit on the Egyptian front. And the actual beginning of the fighting, I was sitting with my men on a hillside, and suddenly mortar shells began to explode in our midst. I looked at the hill opposite, and there were those strangers aiming mortars at us and shooting shells at us. You know what my first instinct was? To call the police. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is the last sane thing that happened to me on the battlefield. The rest was insane. So there is very little about the battlefield, but a lot about the traumas of the, far, of the past. A lot about the complexity of the Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Arab conflict. A lot about moral ambiguities. A lot about the shadow of war and the insecurity of existence on the edge of the abyss. Our literature is essentially a literature of immigrants. Almost every one of us Israelis is an immigrant or a child of immigrants or a grandchild of immigrants. There are today, worldwide, about 8 million speakers of Hebrew. This is a lot. When I was a little boy, the overall number of speakers of Hebrew worldwide was hardly a few hundred thousands, all of them in British Palestine. Everyone over the age of 45 spoke other languages. Yiddish, Ladino, Russian, Polish, German, Hungarian, but not Hebrew. So much so that as a child I feared that when I turn 45, I will start, suddenly start speaking Yiddish. <laughs> it is a land of immigrants. The majority of the speakers of Hebrew were not born into Hebrew. It's the language of 8 million people, but it's not the mother tongue of most of them. It's a learned language for most of them. And the experience of immigration is a very spatial experience, a very spatial life experience, and it has a strong impact on our literature, no less than the war, no less than the battlefield. You know, immigrant, someone who comes from another country, determined to forget the old country completely, to erase it but he or she will never be able to forget the old country. It haunts them in dreams, in nightmares, in longings, in memories. And then the immigrate, immigrant hopes that in the new country, all the hopes will be fulfilled. Very soon he or she learn that not all the hopes will be fulfilled in the new country. And most of the hopes will not be fulfilled in the new country. And that's when the family of immigrants becomes a kind of Cape Kennedy. The child of the family becomes a rocket into which the family pumps vitamins and education and resources and investment and ambitions, hoping that one day this rocket will take the family hopes high to the sky. Uh, moreover, immigrants forever feel insecure. And if they are in the shadow of a daily threat from a hostile neighborhood, from a hostile Arab and Muslim world, the traumas of the past are redoubled. Immigrants always feel that the children are the most important thing in their lives. And this is strongly reflected in our literature. I will digress for a split se second for an anecdote. I am a notorious digressor. The shortest and most powerful political speech I ever heard from a politician 
came some 50 years ago from the mayor of Ramat Gan, of the city of Ramat Gan. His name was Avraham Krinitsi. And it was the tree planting festival in Israel. One day every year, we have a tree planting festival. And there was a gathering of all the kindergarten children in the city of Ramat Gan, each child holding a plant, a sapling, in his or her hand. Thousands of little children. And the mayor stands in front of them, also holding a sapling, and he has to make a speech to the little children. It's not easy for a politician to make a speech to little children. What do you say to them? All the promises that I promised you before the elections I didn't fulfill because I had difficulties, but if you re-elect me once again, I will fulfill all my promises. What do you say to little children? So Mr. Krenitsi, from the depth of his heart and in a heavy Russian accent, uttered a one-sentence speech. He said, dear children, you are the saplings, and we are the manure. <laughs> this is not a statement about politicians. This is a statement about immigrants, about the feeling of immigrants and their children. My parents, my grandparents, they left Europe in the 1930s. They were forced to leave Europe in the 1930s. But they were really devoted Europeans. It's not a big deal today. Everyone is a European, and those who are not European yet are standing in line to become Europeans. <laughs> One day, Turkey will become Europe, and after that, who knows, perhaps Iraq and Afghanistan will also become Europe. <laughs> but 80 years ago, the only Europeans in Europe were Jewish people like my family. Everyone else was a Bulgarian patriot, or an Irish patriot, or a Norwegian patriot, or a Polish patriot. My parents regarded themselves as Europeans. They never regarded themselves as Russians or Poles or Lithuanians. They were Europeans. They knew many languages. They were polyglots. They knew the cultures of Europe, many cultures, and they loved the cultures. They knew the respective histories of European countries, and they loved the histories of Europe. They loved the landscape. They loved the small villages with the meadow and the forest and the little stream, and the bridge on the stream. And they loved the ancient cities with the cobblestone squares, and the cathedrals, and the sound of bells in the darkness. They loved everything European. Above all, they loved the music. How they loved the music to the point of tears. Europe never loved them back. For being Europeans, they were labeled cosmopolitans. For being Europeans, they were labeled intellectuals without roots. For being Europeans, they were labeled parasites. And some of you may remember that those pejoratives, cosmopolitans, intellectuals without roots, parasites, they were the shared vocabulary, vocabulary of the Nazis and of the communists. And when they said intellectuals without roots, cosmopolitans, parasites, they meant my parents for loving Europe. In fact, they were brutally kicked out of Europe in the 1930s when anti-Semitism in Europe became violent, and they had to leave. Fortunately for them, if Europe would not have kicked them violently in the 1930s, it would have murdered them in the 1940s. They had nowhere to go. No place in the world wanted the Jews in the 1930s. No place in the world. My grandfather, in the city of Vilnius in Lithuania, applied for an American visa. He was told he had to wait 17 years. He had no 17 years to wait in Europe of the, of the 1930s. He applied for French citizenship, they turned him down. He applied for British citizenship, they turned him down. He was even mad enough to apply for a German citizenship just a few months before Hitler came to power, and I'm eternally grateful to the Germans for turning him down, or else I would not be here today. So they sadly resolved to travel to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was the only available lifeboat. The policy of Canada, for example, about Jewish immigration in the 1930s was one is too many. Switzerland claimed none is too many. 
Australia was more sophisticated than that. The Prime Minister of Australia in the 1930s declared that anti-Semitism is a monster. Anti-Semitism is abhorrent. Anti-Semitism is ugly. And therefore, we don't let the Jews in Australia because we don't want to import anti-Semitism. <laughs> They had to go to Israel, but they always, always had this love-hate relationship with Europe, this mixture of nostalgia and disappointment. Today I know that such, such an emotion is called an unrequited love. They didn't share it with me. You don't share with little children your disappointments with a lover who kicked you out. But now I know that they loved Europe and were not loved by it. My father used to joke bitterly. He used to say, in Czechoslovakia, there are three nationalities. There are Czechs, there are Slovaks, and there are Czechoslovaks, which are ourselves, the Jews. In Yugoslavia, there are nine nationalities, Serbs and Croats and Montenegrians, Montenegrians and Slovenians, but there is also a Yugoslav nation, which is us, the Jews, and so on. As a child, I didn't understand how bitter this joke was. Now I know it was painful and bitter. My father could read 16 languages. He spoke 11, all of them with a heavy Russian accent. He even spoke Arabic with a heavy Russian accent. <laughs> so much so that when we walked once into an Arabic restaurant in Jerusalem and my father greeted the proprietors in high-flown Arabic, there was a moment of embarrassment and then they answered him in a very polite English, not because they didn't understand his Arabic, but because they didn't even realize it was Arabic. <laughs> However, he could speak 11 languages. My mother could speak four or five. They used to speak between themselves in Russian and in Polish for me not to understand. And 90% of the time, they wanted me not to understand what they were talking about, not because they were talking about sex, but because they were talking about catastrophes. They were talking about the Holocaust that just occurred in Europe, and they were talking about the impending Holocaust in Jerusalem once the British leave and the Arabs will come and kill all of us. This was not for the child, so they conversed in Russian and Polish. They read books in German, French, and English for culture. They dreamt their dreams in Yiddish. But me, they insisted on teaching only Hebrew. In Jerusalem of the 1940s, my parents didn't want me to know even one European language. They were afraid that if I had a European language, even one, I might be seduced by the deadly charms of Europe. I will go to Europe and catch my death. So for my own safety, only Hebrew. The first non-Hebrew words I learned to pronounce in English, except for yes and, yes and no, were the words, British go home, which is what we kids in Jerusalem used to shout at the British patrols as we were throwing stones at them in the original intifada, the intifada of the Jews against the British in 1946, 1947, speaking about ironies of history. However, my parents forever dreamt about Europe. They used to say to me that one day, not in their lifetime, but maybe in my lifetime, our Jerusalem will develop and become a real city. I had no idea what they were talking about. To me, Jerusalem was the only real city. Even Tel Aviv was a dream for me. But today I know that when my parents used the words real city, they meant a city with a river in the middle and bridges across the river. <laughs> it was hard. The immigration was hard. The immigration was hard for everybody, even for the children of the immigrants and even for the grandchildren of the immigrants. And not only the immigrants from Europe. A million Israelis came from Arab and Islamic countries, a million Israeli Jews. They have the same love-hate relationship about Egypt and Iraq and Morocco and Yemen as my parents had about Europe. The same love-hate relationship. It's difficult to be an immigrant. Let me tell you one anecdote of immigration. And I will tell it in the way of demonstrating 
that I believe there is no distinction between comedy and tragedy. When we are young, we all think that comedy and tragedy are two different planets. When you reach to be my age, you will realize that comedy and tragedy are no more than two different windows through which we view the same landscape, the backyard of our life. And also, there is no distinction between fiction and no fiction. Everything is a tale. Our fantasies is also reality. So the year is 1993. And my grandmother Shlomit, a very European lady, bourgeois, middle class, well-mannered, she knew three or four languages, she was educated, she was polite, and she was very genteel. And she stands in the streets of Jerusalem, dusky Jerusalem, hot, sweaty Jerusalem, with the arid hilltops or hillsides, and she stands there wearing her silk dress with a fedora hat with a feather. And she cast one terrified glance at the dusky streets of Jerusalem, at the markets, with the noisy, smelly merchandise in the markets, and the terrible smells to her, terrible smells of oriental flavors and, and uh, oriental uh, uh, food. And she looks at the men in the market, half naked, sun-tained, muscular, washed in sweat, and speaking and shouting in a guttural language. She looked at all that, and she issued a verdict. The Levant, she said, is full of microbes. <laughs> and this became her motto for the 25 years of her life in Jerusalem. She was forever fighting the germs. Ask me, I remember going with my grandmother in the streets of Jerusalem. The germs were running away to the other side of the street. They were afraid of her. She was in the habit of boiling everything. She would boil the vegetables. She would boil the fruit. She would boil herself almost three times every day by taking three hot baths every single day of her life in Jerusalem, summer and winter. When she was over 80 and with a serious heart condition, her doctor said to her, dear lady, if you go on taking three, three very hot baths every day, I am not responsible for what might happen. She considered his words. She decided she was more afraid of the germs than she was of the doctor. And she went on taking her hot baths. And indeed, my grandmother died in the bathtub. <laughs> Tragedy or comedy, I'm asking you. In her death certificate, which I haven't seen, it probably says that the cause of death is a heart attack. This is good enough for the police. It is not good enough for a writer. I dig deeper, and I erase the cause of death, heart attack, and I write instead, the cause of death, cleanliness. <laughs> her cleanliness killed her. But even this is not enough for me. I dig further deeper, and I say that the cause of my grandmother's death is her obsession, her phobia of the Middle East, which made her take three very hot baths every day and die of cleanliness of a heart attack in the bathtub. We are not finished. I believe that underneath her phobia of the Middle East, there lurked a secret fascination with the Middle East. Yes, an erotic fascination. Yes, those half-naked men in the market, sun-tamed, sweaty, muscular, Gatteral, what killed my grandmother was her secret attraction to the Middle East, which made her wear her cleanliness like a chastity belt around her body and die of cleanliness of a heart attack in the bathroom. I'm not finished. If you have patience, I'm going to dig even deeper into this because this is important. What killed my grandmother was her fear of her fascination with the Middle East, her erotic fascination with the Middle East, 
a fear that made her wear her cleanliness like a chastity belt around her body and die of cleanliness in the bathtub of a heart attack in Jerusalem. <laughs> one more step. One more, just one more. Ultimately, I believe that what killed my grandmother was the anger. She was angry with, my, with herself for being afraid of her own attraction to the Middle East, a fear that made her wear the chastity belt of cleanliness around her body and die of cleanliness in the bus tube. Comedy or tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, fiction or non-fiction, ladies and gentlemen, who cares, it doesn't matter. But this will convey to you some of the experience of immigrants and some of the essence of Israeli literature. That's what we are all about. It's funny and it's awesome and it's shocking. And many people here in Brazil know the experience of immigration because some of you may be immigrants or the children of immigrants or the grandchildren of immigrants. However, let me tell you this about Israel. Countries are born out of geography. They are born out of history. They are born out of politics and demography, not Israel. Israel was born out of a dream. And everything that is born out of a dream is destined to be a disappointment. The only way to keep a dream perfect and rosy and unspoiled is never to leave it out. This is true of everything. This is true of traveling abroad. This is true of writing a novel. This is true of living out a sexual fantasy. This is true of raising a family. Once it is fulfilled, it's slightly disappointing. Yes, Israel tastes like a slight disappointment. But the disappointment is not in the nature of Israel. It is in the nature of dreams. Israel is a dream come true, and therefore it is disappointing. Now I just said that Israel was born out of a dream. This is not accurate. Israel was actually born out of a whole range of dreams, a whole panel of dreams, a whole spectrum of dreams. I will tell you about some of the dreamers, the dreams of the founding fathers and mothers of Israel. Some of them dreamt that Israel will become a biblical country, a renewal of the kingdoms, the ancient kingdoms of David and Solomon, a nation of soldiers and priests and peasants and prophets. Still others dreamt that Israel should become a replica of an East European Jewish shtetl. To this day, I confront with non-Israeli Jews who come to Israel for the first time and express to me their disappointment. No bagel, no locks, no Jewish state. <laughs> Still others were Marxist Zionists. They believed in Stalin. They had a dream, which they never put into words, but in my head as a storyteller, I will reveal their dream to you. They secretly dreamt until 1952 that one day Stalin himself will come for a visit in a kibbutz. <laughs> and they will give Stalin the grand tour of the kibbutz, the chicken poultry, the cow shed, and then they will drag Stalin to the communal dining hall for a lengthy discussion about Marxism-Leninism, and they will teach Stalin once and for all what Marxism-Leninism really meant, <laughs> Because they knew better. I'm not being ironical. They really knew better than Stalin. And then at the end of the night, so they dreamt, at the end of the night, Stalin will rise to his feet and say to them in juicy Russian, bloody Jews, I have to admit, you did socialism here better than we did in Russia, and then die of happiness. <laughs> and next door to those Marxist Zionists, there live the middle class Zionists and the middle European Zionists who dreamt of creating in the heart of the Middle East a replica of Austro-Hungary of the Emperor Franz Joseph <laughs> with red tiled roofs and very good manners and people calling each other, other her director of our doctor <laughs> and peace and quiet between two and four in the afternoon every day. And next door to those, but I could go on for the rest of this evening, or maybe write a trilogy one day, which I still threaten to do, about the tremendous variety of the dreams and master plans and visions of the founding fathers and mothers of Israel. 
Obviously, those dreams could not be fulfilled, partly because it's not in the nature of dreams to be fully fulfilled, and partly because these dreams were conflicting and mutually exclusive. So, what became of all these dreams? Some of them have died and forgotten. Many of them are still alive and struggling with each other under a different banner. Some of them have turned into nightmares. And some of them are the reality of Israel. But the actual reality of Israel is totally different than any of the dreams of the founding fathers and mothers. Let me tell you, there is a huge difference between Israel of the media, I don't know the Brazilian media, but the European media and the American media, the, the Israel of the CNN and the real Israel. In the Israel of the media, there are 80% religious fanatics or hot-headed zealots of settlers in the West Bank, 19% heartless soldiers in the roadblocks, and 1% of wonderful intellectuals like myself who criticize the government and struggle for peace. This has nothing to do with the reality of Israel. In fact, about 80% of the Israeli Jewish people live on the coastal plain. They don't live in Jerusalem and they don't live in the settlements. They live on the coastal plain. They are not orthodox. They are middle class, noisy, passionate, pushy, argumentative, talkative, warm-hearted, in short, a very Mediterranean nation. We Israelis belong in a Fellini movie, not in an Ingmar Bergman film. <laughs> you will figure out from what I just said that I love Israel even at times when I don't like it. In fact, I love Israel even at moments when I can't stand it, and there are such moments for political reasons. But I love it because of the diversity and the argumentativeness. If you promise to take what I'm going to say now with a smile, I will tell you that Israel is not a nation, Israel is not a country, Israel is a fiery collection of arguments. Eight million citizens, eight million prime ministers, eight million prophets and messiahs. Everyone with his or her personal formula for instant redemption. Everyone shout at the tops of their voices, no one ever listens. <laughs> Except for me, I listen sometimes, that's how I make a living. <laughs> Every line by a bus stop in Israel is likely to catch a spark and turn into a fiery street seminary with total strangers while waiting for the bus, arguing passionately on politics, morality, religion, history, and the real purpose of God. With the participants of such a street seminary, total strangers, while disagreeing on political and metaphysical good and evil, are nevertheless elbowing their way to the top of the line. <laughs> if you come to Israel as tourists and you have a sleepless night in the hotel, I have a proposition for you. Pick up the telephone, dial any number at all at random, <laughs> and you get yourself a wonderful argument on the topic of your choice. <laughs> All of this is reflected intensely in our literature. Israel might be the only country in the world where prime ministers invite writers and poets for a late night soul-searching conversation, not in the office, in the private mention of the Prime Minister. I have been through this game <coughs> with seven or eight out of our ten Prime Ministers since Israel was created. And uh, the Prime Minister will ask you, where have we gone wrong? Where does the nation go from here? He will admire your answers and ignore them completely. But that's only natural. You can't expect the present generation of Israeli writers and poets and intellectuals to be more successful than the prophets. Even the prophets in their day were not very successful in changing the minds of the rulers or the heart of the people. So, in a strange sense, Israel is a refugee camp, a threatened refugee camp. 
Palestine is also a refugee camp. The clash between Israelis and Palestinians is a tragic clash between two refugee camps. Actually, it's a clash between two victims of Europe. The Arabs were the victims of Europe through imperialism, colonialism, exploitation and humiliation. The Jews were the victims of Europe through discrimination, persecution, and ultimately mass murder on an unprecedented scale. You would have thought that two victims, especially two victims of the same oppressor, love one another and hug one another and march together to the barricades to fight against their oppressors. Not so. In real life, some of the worst conflicts are precisely the conflicts between two victims of the same past oppressor. Two children of the same violent parent don't love one another. They look at each other and they say, you are exactly like him. No, you are exactly like him. And this is precisely the situation between Jew and Arab in the Middle East. The Arabs are looking at us Israelis and they don't see us as what we really are, are a bunch of half hysterical survivors and refugees. No, they see us as an extension of the white, sophisticated, oppressing, colonizing Europe. We look at the Arabs. We don't see them as fellow victims of Europe. We see them as a new incarnation of our past oppressors, Cossacks pogrom makers, anti-Semites, Nazis, who grew mustaches and wore kafias, but they are in the same old anti-Semitic game of cutting Jewish throats for entertainment. Yes, the clash between Israel and Palestine is, in my view, a clash between right and right. And many of the Israeli writers and poets share this opinion, and much of the Israeli literature is about this moral ambiguity. It's a clash between right and right because the Palestinians are in Palestine, they have no other land. The Israeli Jews are in Israel, they have no other land. The Palestinians have nowhere to go. Some of them went as refugees to the neighboring Arab countries, but they were humiliated and oppressed and kept in camps in dehumanizing conditions. They have learned the hard way that they are not Egyptians and not Lebanese and not Syrians, they are Palestinians. The Israeli Jews have no other land. They are all survivors and refugees, like my parents, like my family, kicked out by Europe or kicked out by the Arab and Islamic countries. Now, this is the definition of a tragedy, a clash between right and right. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a clash between wrong and wrong. But I believe in the possibility of an historical compromise between Israelis and Palestinians. I believe such a compromise is not only possible, but also feasible. Yes, we'll have to divide a very small country. It's very, very small. We'll have to divide it into two even smaller apartments. We'll have to divide the house into two smaller apartments. I think in English this arrangement is called a semi-detached house. And we'll have to learn to live like, like neighbors. Now I've got some good news for you. You are all used to hear the bad news from the Middle East. Let me share with you some good news from the Middle East for a change. The majority of the Israeli Jews and the majority of the Palestinian Arabs accept now, not with joy, but they accept now the two-state solution, Israel next door to Palestine. Public opinion surveys in Israel and in Palestine show month after month that about 70% of the population in Israel and in, in occupied Palestine, 70% heavy-heartedly, unhappily accept the two-state solution. Are they happy about it in Israel and in Palestine? They are not happy about it. Will they be dancing in the streets when the two-state solution is implemented? They will not be dancing in the streets. It's going to hurt like amputation both to the Israelis and to the Palestinians. The Israelis will have to sacrifice the, best, the West Bank, which is the historical and biblical cradle of the Jewish people. 
which is where many of the biblical occurrences took place, which is where the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Israelites lived thousands of years ago. And we will have to renounce the West Bank because it's heavily populated by Palestinians. The Palestinians will have to renounce cities like Haifa and Jaffa and Beersheba, which used to belong to them before 48, and they will have to say goodbye to those people, to those places. This is going to hurt, but this surgery is unavoidable. The Israelis and the Palestinians cannot, cannot live together like one happy family because they are not one, because they are not happy, and because they are not even family. They are two unhappy families. I would say the following. The patient, Israeli and Palestinian, is reluctantly ready for the surgery, but the doctors are cowards. Ladies and gentlemen, this moral ambiguity has been reflected by our writers and poets for more than 40 years now, since the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel occupied the West Bank and occupied the Gaza Strip and occupied the Golan Heights and occupied Sinai and occupied West Jerusalem. So we will have to seek a compromise. I know that the word compromise has a very negative connotation in the ears of young idealists. Young idealists tend to think that compromise is dishonest. Compromise is soft. Compromise is lack of integrity. Not in my vocabulary. In my vocabulary, ladies and gentlemen, the word compromise is synonymous to the word life. And where there is life, there are compromises. And the opposite of compromise is not idealism. And the opposite of compromise is not integrity. The opposite of compromise is fanaticism and death. When I say compromise, I don't mean capitulation. I am not in the business of turning the other cheek to an enemy. I have been on the battlefield twice in my life. And if Israel's existence is threatened, I will go to the battlefield a third time and a fourth time. But I will only fight, if necessary, over the existence of Israel and its freedom, not over extra territories, not over holy places, not over resources, not over so-called national interests. I will only fight for life and for freedom. Unlike pacifists in other countries who think that the ultimate evil is war, I maintain that the ultimate evil is aggression. And aggression sometimes must be repelled by force. However, compromise is not capitulation. Compromise is not turning the other cheek. Compromise is an attempt to meet the other somewhere halfway. And believe me, I know one or two things about compromises, having been married to the same woman for more than 50 years now. <laughs> now, I said two-state solution, Israel next door to Palestine. I don't like to make predictions and prophecies, but let me tell you this, one day, sooner or later, there will be a Palestinian embassy in Israel and an Israeli embassy in Palestine. And those two embassies will be walking distance from one another because one of them will be in West Jerusalem, in Jewish West Jerusalem, and the other one in Arab East Jerusalem. This is painful. I was born in Jerusalem. I love Jerusalem, I love all of it, but the city is in fact divided between Jew and Arab, and this will have to be reflected in the compromise solution. People ask me, what about the holy places? What about the disputed holy places? My grandmother, Shlomit, the one who died of cleanliness, she had the answer to that. When I was a very little boy, my grandmother, Shlomit, explained to me in very simple words, the difference between Jew and Christian, not between Jew and Arab, but between Jew and Christian. And she said the following, she said, you see my boy, the Christians believe that the Messiah have been here once and he will come again one day. We Jews believe that the Messiah has not yet been here and he is still to come. Over this disagreement said my grandmother, you cannot imagine my boy, how much anger and hatred and persecution and bloodshed 
Why, she said. Why can't everybody simply wait and see? <laughs> if the Messiah comes saying, hello, it's nice to see you again, the Jews will have to apologize to the Christians. <laughs> if, on the other hand, the Messiah comes saying, how do you do? It's good to meet you. The entire Christian world will have to apologize to the Jews. Until then, said my, great, my, my wise grandmother, live and let live. And this is the answer to the issue of the disputed holy places in Jerusalem. Let there be practical arrangements on the ground so that everybody can pray. Jew, Christian, Muslim, everybody can come and pray. And let us wave no flag over the holy places. The Messiah will come one day and he will tell us, or she will tell us, one day. Ultimately, let me conclude by telling you this. I defined the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a tragedy, a clash between right and right. Tragedies can be resolved in one of two manners. There is the Shakespeare manner of resolving a tragedy, and there is the Chekhov manner of resolving a tragedy. In a tragedy by Shakespeare, in the end, the stage is covered with dead bodies, and maybe justice prevails high above. In the conclusion of a tragedy by Chekhov, everyone is melancholy, unhappy, disappointed, bitter, heartbroken, but alive. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my friends and I, thank you. My friends and I, many of the Israeli writers and poets, we have been fighting, struggling, to find not a happy ending. There can be no happy ending to a clash between right and right. We were struggling to find a Chekhovian, not a Shakespearean conclusion to the Israeli-Palestinian tragedy. Thank you very much for your patience and your tolerance. Thank you very much.